realize this, Mr. Thompson, but you are our first author visit since COVID. Wow. So welcome Thank to the you. building. Let's celebrate the fact that we Buckingham Spit. Spit, sorry. Spit. Thank you so much for coming. You're Glad welcome. You. Thanks for having me. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. So I am here to talk to you about my new book, Buccaneer Spit. Uh, it is a book that is, uh, uh, there's a lot of nature in it. It's about two young people about your age trying to save a pristine spit of land from a very unscrupulous guy. And uh, uh, so it's called Buccaneer Spit, A Race for the Treasure. Um, my publisher made me put the second part of the title on there because they were worried that girls were going to think that the book was about that. But it's not. A spit of land is a small point of land, especially sand or gravel, running into a body of water. And the book's actually inspired by a, a real situation that happened outside of Charleston, South Carolina, which is where I live. And it, it was a place called Captain Sam Spit. And some people were trying to develop Captain Sam Spit, which is a very special, pristine, unspoiled, and beautiful place. And I was on the board of an organization called the Coastal Conservation League, and we were trying to prevent this from happening. It actually went, went up to the South Carolina Supreme Court four different times. We won four different times, and the court finally told the lower court, you've sent this to us four times, it all, each time in a little bit different uh, form. Don't send it to us again. It's a done deal. So that we were able to save it. Uh, but spits are often places of great, really incredible beauty. That's a spit of land right there skinny little piece of land connected to the mainland in one, on one end, but surrounded by water on the other two ends. Now, it, in the case of Buccaneer Spit, it's a, um, there's a little river. It's not a big body of water, just a little river on one side and then the Atlantic Ocean on the other. But Buccaneer Spit is full of wild nature. And down in South Carolina, we have those things. Every time you find fresh water, you find an alligator. If any of you have dogs and you like to let your dogs run around ponds and they like to go swimming like you have a lab or something like that or a Boykin Spaniel, you can't because there's something in the pond that's going to eat them. Um, it's a place where porpoises strand mullet, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Spits provide rookeries for tons of seabirds, all kinds of birds, like egrets, like brown pelicans, like does anybody know what that bird is? Yes. Albatross? No. You're close, actually. Yes. Aaron? No, it's an ibis. And if you ever come down to South Carolina at about sunset, ibises are pretty big birds. Their wingspans probably like that. They're all white, as you can see, and they have these great scimitar orange beaks. And at, at 5 or 6 o'clock at night, as the sun's starting to come down, you'll see a flock of them, They'll maybe eight or 10, and they tend to glide. They'll just cruise over the tops of the palmetto trees as they head toward their evening uh, roosts. And it's a really beautiful thing to see at sunset. American oyster catchers, 
least terns, black skimmers, tricolored herons, all these and many more are actually birds, Wilson's plover, are birds that uh, nest or rest on spits of land that are unspoiled. Uh, they, they will stop doing it in many cases if they, get, if, if they start to build on those places because they need places that are safe and quiet. There's a bird called a red knot, which many of you, if you've been to the beach, how many of you have been to a beach at some point? Okay, you've seen birds that people tend to call, they, they lump a bunch of different birds together and call them sandpipers. They're the little birds that when the, when the wave goes out, they run down uh, and they peck into the sand and try to find food. And when a wave comes back in, they, they run away again. Then they're kind of fun to look at. And if people have their dogs on the beach, the dogs like to chase them and make them fly. The thing about red knots that's important is that First of all, red knots are in the steepest decline in years because the habitat, and these guys are, they're, they're a great indicator species because when habitat gets destroyed, fragile species like red knots uh, are the first to, to show the effect of that destruction of habitat. But why, why the big deal on red knots? Red knots actually migrate every single year from down here at the tip of Argentina all the way up, all through South America, all the way up here, and all the way up to here. They go 9,000 miles twice a year. These little birds about this big, they don't have much fat, and so when they fly in and they, they land on some unspoiled spit of land in a place like South Carolina, they absolutely are out of fuel and they are exhausted and they need to rest and they need a safe place to do it. So even if people are around the beach and they're letting their dogs chase these funny little birds that, you know, go down and back and down and back when the waves come in and out, those birds actually are uh, uh, in mortal peril because they don't have enough energy left to keep flying if dogs are chasing them. They need to rest and eat. Another thing about spits that's really interesting is that it's a place where loggerhead turtles, loggerheads are an endangered species, they're sea turtles, they come onto shore one time a year, and that's to lay eggs. They come in once, they dig a hole in the sand, they lay their eggs, they fill the hole up, and they go back out to sea. <clears throat> when the baby turtles hatch, they come out of the sand, and they, they almost always hatch at night. They come out of the sand and they look for light. They look for starlight and moonlight. Because if you think about an unspoiled beach, behind them there are trees that block the light. But out in front of them you have the open ocean and you have, it's faint light, but there's light that, that they, and they move toward that light because they, for their survival, need to get into the water as quickly as they can. A lot of predators, foxes, coyotes, possums, raccoons, uh, will be out waiting for them to hatch, hoping to get a meal, and they need to get to the water as quick as they can. Now, if there are houses along the beach, the houses, and if the houses have their lights on, the turtles will go the wrong way. And they'll go back and they'll, they'll end up on the, in the lawn, somebody's lawn, and, and they will not make it to the ocean and they will not survive. So e even on, in places where turtles do nest, where there are houses, there are all kinds of volunteers that come around and ask people to, um, when they spot turtles' nests, they spot the places that have been dug up, they'll put tape around it, ask people to keep dogs off the beach, and then they'll ask people who live in the houses to turn their lights down at night, turn their lights off at night on the water side so that the turtles, when they hatch, don't come toward their houses, but in fact, go the right direction. Now, you all know why you shouldn't throw plastic bags in the water? Yes, sir. Absolutely correct. The favorite food of sea turtles is our jellyfish. And, jelly, and sea turtles have horrible eyesight. I mean, really bad eyesight. So they swim up to a plastic bag and it looks to them just like a jellyfish and they'll eat it. The problem is when the, when the plastic bag gets in their stomach, that's as far as it's going. It, they can't digest it. It can't go through them. They can't absorb it and they can't pass it. And so what happens is all the other food that they try to eat doesn't give them any nourishment, and they die. So uh, one of the things in this book, the two kids, it's about 
a girl named Callie and a boy named Finn. And Callie is a South, Car she's a New York City girl who gets, spends every spring vacation at her grandfather's in South Carolina. Now when Callie goes down this year, this particular year when the book starts, she's going down to South Carolina by herself, not with her, her parents. Her parents have always, they've always done this together. It's always been a family trip. Only this year her parents have some secret that they're talking about and they're upset about it and she knows that they're upset and she's convinced that they're getting a divorce. She's wrong. She'll find out in the process of the book what happened, what's really going on, but she's really upset when she gets down to South Carolina. She doesn't like being, <clears throat> being cut out of whatever it is that's going on that seems to be very important in her family. Now, her grandfather happens to own Buccaneer Spit. He bought Buccaneer Spit. He's a retired school head, and he bought Buccaneer Spit in order to preserve it forever, and he loves this place. He loves nature. He's a total nature nut. And when Callie gets down to South Carolina, she finds out from Finn that her grandfather's selling Buccaneer Spit. She can't figure out why this is going on, too. So there are now two big mysteries in her, in her family, and both of them are really bad. And, she, and her grandfather is not telling her anything about his, his impending sale. She finds out from her friend. Her grandfather doesn't say a word to her. So. The person who's buying Buccaneer Spit is a unscrupulous individual, and Callie's afraid they're going to build a whole lot of houses on Buccaneer Spit and ruin it. And he's, even if her grandfather had to sell it, she's surprised that he's selling it to this particular individual. Now, when they see this individual on the beach, he's got this piece of paper that he keeps referring to, and he tucks it back into a plastic bag and it sticks it in his coat pocket but he, it's something that he really cares about, apparently. And one day when they're, the kids are watching him out on the beach when he's got people doing work to, to you know, maybe uh, 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 to, to determine where houses can be built, the kids think there's something buried on Buccaneer Spit. It used to be a Navy base during World War II. They think that there's something that's probably very environmentally poisonous uh, and that this individual's gonna try and sneak it off the property uh, in, an, in, an, in a way that is, uh, uh, will not cause him any, any co will not cost him any money, and that he's going to try and get around all the environmental rules. And that's, that's their initial thought. So he's on the beach one day, he's holding this plastic bag with his paper in it, and the wind rips it out of his hand and sends it out into the, into the water, out into the Atlantic Ocean. And when it lands in the water, a sea turtle sticks its head up takes a look at that plastic bag and eats it. Well, the developer's trying to, he's trying to call his, his people that work for him to get them to catch that sea turtle and drag it on shore because he's going to get that, he's going to cut that thing out um, in any way and the sea turtle's not going to have a very good day. The kids call what's called sea turtle rescue, which is actually in South Carolina something real and it's part of the, the Department of Natural Resources, and they pick up sea turtles that are having difficulty. There are three big reasons why ha they have difficulties, um, and I'll, I'll explain those in a second, but they take the sea turtles to the South Carolina Aquarium where they have a sea turtle hospital. And I've been through the sea turtle hospital. If you ever get down there, ask for a tour of it. It's a very cool thing to see. But the reasons, three reasons that sea turtles become uh, uh, sick are one they've eaten plastic or they've yeah pl some kind of thing that they can't pass two that a boat propeller has hit them and and has cut their shell and three uh, it happens in the winter time sometimes there'll be a big cold snap and these are cold-blooded creatures they can't live in water that is too cold and if they try to swim south and get to warmer water, but if they can't do it fast enough, they actually get paralyzed in the cold and they will drown. So uh, in all three of those cases, uh, the sea turtle rescue will pick them up, take them into the sea turtle hospital, and they will be resuscitated. In, in the case of a cut shell, they can stitch uh, underneath the shell, the doctors, and then they can glue the shell back together. And they will keep the sea turtle there until the, until the uh, injury is uh, uh, healed enough, and then they can 
they release it back out into the wild. The same thing if a cold, if a cold shock turtle comes in, they slowly but surely bring its temperature back up, release it again. And if the turtle comes in with something in its stomach, they do an endoscopy, which is they sedate the turtle and they put this big long, this big long instrument that has a light, a camera, and a pincher down its throat and they remove the offending article and, and then when, when you go to the sea turtle hospital and they've, uh, they've operated on one of these turtles, they will have next to the turtle, because they have them in these kind of big baby pools, and it'll have next to the turtle the thing that they took out of its stomach. And a lot of times, you've all been to birthday parties where people have helium-filled balloons, and one or two of those will get away, and if they go out into the ocean, uh, those, they lose their gas at some point, they fall in and they get, they get eaten like candy by sea turtles. And so you'll see all these things that they've taken out of sea turtle stomachs. So Callie and Finn call sea turtle rescue. And the sea turtle rescue gets there before the, 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 the bad guy can, can uh, have his people catch the sea turtle. Sea turtle rescue takes the turtle into the, into the aquarium and the next day, Callie and Finn go in and watch the endoscopy. And they tell the, the vets after the operation is done, they said, you know, we're the ones that called that turtle in. Could we have the bag that you took out of its stomach? And they said, well, we normally don't give those things to anybody. But yeah, in your case, we will, because you did it such a good thing. So when they get the bag, they expect to see something very different when they take the paper out of it. But what they find is something that looks very much like that. And then the book becomes a race to find out where that map leads and what it leads to. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the, gist, the gist of the book. I'm going to give you a quick reading to give you a little sense of what the book's like. Now, this takes place the very first day that Callie is in South Carolina. And she wakes up early and she takes her grandfather's dog. He's a Jack Russell terrier, little, little terrier, named Plankton. You have all seen uh, SpongeBob cartoons, right? And, and you know the little green guy that wants to take over the world, okay? That's the personality that a Jack Russell terrier has. So I threw the ball another six or seven times until Plankton's tongue was hanging out of his mouth, at which point I took the water bottle from my bag and poured some into my cupped hand to let him drink. Afterward, he trotted beside me as we walked toward the very end of the spit where the river met the ocean. The morning was cloudless, the temperature already getting up into the 70s and a nice sea breeze keeping the gnats away. I sat on a palmetto log a few yards above the tide line that had been washed in by a storm. Unlike most beaches where the water gets deep slowly, the river had scoured out the ocean bottom here, so it dropped sharply just a few yards offshore. Also, because of the river, the current was often very powerful and unpredictable and could easily sweep a person out to sea. I knew never to swim here and Plankton didn't want any more to do with water than to get his feet wet, so I didn't worry as I watched him trot down by the ocean's edge and sniff the shells. Out past Plankton on the horizon, a distant freighter looking as small as a toy boat angled its way toward Charleston Harbor. Closer in, a sailboat with all of its canvas up was heeling down the coast, its white sails looking like the wings of a seabird. Everything sure is peaceful and quiet, I said to Plankton, but some people might also call it boring. I was thinking that a lot of kids I knew would roll their eyes and ask what there was to do here. But if mom and dad had been there, they would have sighed and said how perfect it all was. That started me thinking about my parents again. I was angry that they had shipped me off while they plotted their divorce. If they'd let me stay home, I could have convinced them that they were being ridiculous and that there was more to think of than just themselves. There was me. I could have shown them what we all meant to each other, but without me, I was afraid that they would end up doing what a bunch of my classmates' parents had done and just go their separate ways. Then there would be weeks with mom and weekends with dad and separate vacations with just one of them. 
I was hunched over, lost in my own dark thoughts when it happened. For a few seconds, nothing was different. Plankton was right in front of me, sniffing near the water's edge. But then he came to a sudden stop, laying his ears back as he looked out at the quiet sea. After a second, he started to growl, but not the kind that said he wanted attention or was getting bored. It was a really deep one, the kind he made when he was getting set to fight. One thing about Jack Russell Terriers, they don't back down, not ever. They might be little, but they have the courage of lions. They're also smart. But here Plankton was, acting totally wild, with his hackles sticking up, growling at absolutely nothing but empty ocean. At least I thought it was nothing, until the first mullet jumped right out of the water onto the shore. Then about two seconds later, another mullet jumped onto the sand. Then a couple more. And then a whole bunch of them started erupting right offshore in a huge flopping tangle that reminded me of popcorn popping. Some of the mullet landed back in the water, but a lot of them came clear out of the water onto the sand. With the fish frantically slapping their tails into the sand on either side, Plankton whipped his head one way, then another, and let out an even angrier growl. Even though I had to admit it was very weird, I almost started laughing at the idea of Plankton being scared by a bunch of silly fish. There's nothing unusual about mullet jumping. They're probably the most jumpiest fish there are. No, nobody knows for sure what makes them do it, but while they jump a lot, they tend to do it one at a time, not all together in big groups. And I had never, ever seen them jump out of the water onto land. I stood up thinking I would throw the crazy beached mullet back into the ocean when the shoreline really exploded. Four huge gray torpedoes shot out of the water, partway onto the sand. Each of them had a pointy mouth full of big teeth, and they started eating the mullet that had jumped ahead of them and were now flopping helpless. I froze, shocked by what I was seeing, even fearing for a second that the big gray shapes were going to keep coming right up the shore to grab me. Even as scared as I was, I could already see that they weren't sharks. These were porpoises, creatures I had always thought of as cute and friendly. Part of my brain was telling me that porpoises couldn't come onto shore to eat people, but the other part of my brain saw that mass of big, squirming, snapping gray bodies and flopping mullet with plankton right between them, and I was suddenly terrified. Plankton, I shouted at the top of my lungs, get away. Unfortunately, just like any Jack Russell, even though his tail was tucked between his legs and he was probably as frightened as I was, Frank Plankton wasn't going to retreat, not even from huge porpoises who were chewing mullet as fast as they could grab them. He just stood there with the hair on his back sticking straight up and his lips curled back over his teeth in the ugliest snarl he could manage. I knew he was halfway ready to jump on one of the porpoises and fight it, but Plankton was a whole lot more mullet-sized than most dogs. It would be too easy for one of the porpoises to grab him and drag him back into the sea. I had to do something, but my body seemed stuck in place. I tried to shout again, wanting to call Plankton to me, but I couldn't even get more words out of my mouth. Everything seemed hopeless when out of the corner of my eye I saw another streak of motion. A person ran past me. There had been no sign of anyone here on the spit, and I had no idea where this one had come from. He raced toward the water at top speed, then bent down and scooped up plankton without slowing, leaping over a porpoise just as it chomped down on another mullet. A second later, plankton's rescuer was standing on the pal by the palmetto trunk where I'd been sitting. He was about my age, with sandy hair worn a little bit long, blue eyes, and a friendly smile. With his chest heaving somewhat from the sprint, he continued holding plankton while the porpoises finished up the last of the beached mullet, then squirmed their way backward into the ocean and disappeared. You're staying right up here until the danger passes, the boy said as he looked down at plankton. The Jack Russell wasn't even growling, which was amazing because plankton didn't take well to strangers. Normally a person he didn't know could never pick him up without risking a serious nip. I suspected plankton was in shock. But it was also possible he was showing gratitude that someone had whisked him away from the gray monsters that could have devoured him. In any case, Plankton rested quietly until the boy put him down at my feet. Your dog almost got stranded, he said. Stranded, I said. He almost got eaten. That's what I meant. When porpoises drive fish onto the beach, it's called stranding. It's one of the ways they feed, and this is one of their favorite places to do it. So that's, that's actually true. Porpoises will do that. They tend to do it only in places that are pretty deserted. 
that actually Captain Sam Spit that I talked to you about before is one of the it's one of the, their favorite places to strand porpoises. And if you happen to be close to the water when they do it, it will scare you. Uh, I mean, you, you can't believe what's going on. Uh, suddenly, these fish. I mean, these six-foot porpoises are shooting right out of the water, eating the mullet that they've driven up onto the sand. So, anybody got questions? Anybody want to ask questions about writing, books, editing? Yes? How long did it take you to do the book? So, when I write a book, it takes me about three months or four months normally to, to get a first draft. And then it takes me probably another six months or more to edit it and get it into the shape that I really want it to be in. So your teachers probably all tell you that when you get assigned a paper, you should write it right away and maybe put it down for a few days and then look at it again and rewrite it. Anybody ever heard that from their teachers? Anybody like to do it? Okay. I figured as much, but that's so important. If, if, if have any of you ever said something really fast and then you wish you could take it back? We've all done that, right? In my opinion, that's what a first draft is. That's a, a first draft is when you say it quick, you get it out on the paper, you think you've said what you think you've answered the, 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 the assignment, you've done what you were supposed to do. But I promise if you put it down for five days and you go back and look at it, you'll find places that you've said something but you haven't said it well. You've missed a point that you should have made. You've said something twice that you don't need to say twice. And you will find that you're, whatever you do, it won't take you that long, but you make it better and you make it considerably more convincing. And as a writer, if, if a writer doesn't rewrite, a writer will never have a book published, ever. And most of us have written a lot and rewritten even more. So that's, it's really important. Um, the other thing I will tell you um, is that, how many of you have written a poem or short story? Okay, almost every one of you. You're using your imagination, and your imagination, you may, not want, you may want to be a writer, you may not want to be a writer. It doesn't really matter. Using your imagination is like building a muscle. It's an invisible muscle, but it's very much a muscle. And if you, if you think about what companies want today, if you think about working for Apple Computer, or you think about working for Tesla, or some really cool company like that, which is maybe what some of you are gonna to wanna to do someday, being creative is critical to getting a job with those kind of people, because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for people who not only can work hard and do their job and understand the things that they need to understand, but people who can think of doing it better people who can think of doing it differently in ways that are really attractive and really exciting. So whatever you, whenever you think about that, think about building your imagination. It's a big deal. It's a very important muscle. Yes? I'm sorry, say that again? How do I get an idea for a book? So when I'm, when I'm working on a book, I start out with a character. I start out, and, or in this case, two characters, and I really wanted, I, I find a character that I really like, and then I do something very mean to them. I put them in a tough position, a position that is, they're going to have to figure out how to get out, how, how to get out of that, or they're going to have to figure out what they need. They have to gather what they need and figure out how to, uh, how to beat somebody, and the fun of, of writing middle grade books is that we find ways, we the writers find ways of getting the parents off stage. We can't have the parents on stage. Why? Because the parents would solve the problem. Any good parent's going to tell their kids, you get back here, I will go, I'll go contend against this bad person. Well, we can't have the parents doing that, right? The kids have to do it. The kids are less mature, weaker, that don't have the same resources that the bad guy has, and yet they have to beat them. I don't write tragedies, I write books that are fun to read, so I know that my characters are going to win, but when I start a book, I don't actually know how they're going to do that. So I, and, and the fun of it is, when your characters start talking to you in your, in your head, they really tell you what they need to do. And when your characters are talking to you, you also realize what they would or would not do. Um, and, and that's kind of where the ideas really come from. But I wanted to write a book also about Captain Sam Spit, about saving a precious natural place, and then I wanted to make it exciting. Yes? Why did you choose the Port of Central Park? 
divorce is a central topic. It's not, it's, not, it's not a central topic, but it is what she fears in the beginning. There's something, she's going to find out what's really going on as the book goes on. Callie has to solve three mysteries in the book. Um, she has to solve what's going on with her parents. She has to solve what's going on with her grandfather. And then she has to solve what's going on in Buccaneer Spit. And all those things are actually locked up together. And so, but yeah, her, so she jumps to conclusions and then she learns that her conclusions are wrong. Yes? My favorite part about writing books? My favorite part about writing books is when my characters do things I don't think, I didn't realize they were going to do. And that happened to me on my second novel. Uh, the second novel that I wrote, which I rewrote 11 times, by the way, just so you know, um, was a book where it was an adult book and some people were on a boat off the coast of Mexico and they were in a dangerous situation and there was a person on the back on the boat who was going to expose them to even more danger <clears throat> and I had at, up until that point I had written an outline I thought you had to write an outline to write a novel and so I, I had here's what has to happen I thought that the plot was more important than the characters I was wrong so I had whatever, I forget what the plot was, was supposed to happen, but my stick characters are supposed to do these following things. But what happened was that the captain came up from down below in the boat. This guy said, I, you know, he, he said that he was going to do something that was going to expose them all to great risk. The captain pulled out a gun and shot him. And I said, uh, that's not part of my outline. Where did that come from? And finally, I, I had this character in my head, and I knew he said to me, this is what I have to do. This is what I would do in this situation. And I went, he's absolutely right. The character started to drive the book. And from that point forward, I've always tried to let my characters drive my books. And so they tell me what's that. And that's the fun of it. Because I, I discover through my characters what's possible and what should happen. And then I try to, then you just try to make it more and more exciting. You try to, what they keep calling, raise the stakes. So instead of having somebody have to jump off something this high, they have to find a way to jump off something 2,000 feet high. You know, so there's, there's got to be a, a, life, a life risk in the book in order to, for it to be really fun. Yes? Uh, building on the Magnus question, what's your least favorite part about writing a book? My least favorite part about writing a book um, is when I've given it to my agent, biting my fingernails until I find out whether a publisher is going to buy it. That's my least favorite part of writing a book. And I've, I've written books that haven't been bought. So um, you put a lot of time into writing a book and, and sometimes people don't buy it for reasons that maybe, maybe are even political. So, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a, it's a funny thing. But um, what else do I not like about writing? Yes, I'm sorry. Draft. What's your daily writing habit like, and where do you like to write? Um, I have two or three places I like to write. We, we have a home in Pennsylvania that I love to go to because it's way out in the boondocks and it's quiet. Um, when I'm not fishing, I'm I'm writing. It's, I love that. I lo in Charleston, uh, I either write on the porch or I write on the third floor. Just I have, you, you, you know, you kind of create these little um, quiet, safe places that you can write. And no, 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 no. I, I, I tried to write by hand. I thought at first that that's what I should do. I tried to write on a legal pad. But you have to, you come up with so many ideas as you're writing and you try to slot another sentence in, but there's no room. So you write it in the margin and you write it this way rather than that way. And then if you don't type it in right away, you can't even, I, I couldn't even read my writing. It was so small and I, I didn't even know where things went. So I started writing full time on a computer. And that way, if I make a mistake or I rethink something, I can cut it and paste it someplace or I can, you know, paste something else in there and it doesn't make a total mess. Yes? Right and Spider made to write this particular book. I should stay close to this, shouldn't I? This, I guess the microphone is... What inspired me to write the book was the real, in this case, the real situation with this, with Captain Sam Spit, because I, I, wor I helped work on that and that was something that I was really proud that we were able to do. 
I wanted to write a book about being able to save a, a, a natural wild place. That's what inspired me, but then I started to think about what else inspired me, and so there are about three or four other themes in the book that are a lot of fun that I also cared a lot about. Yes? Can you say that a little louder? My biggest hit so far has been The Girl from Felony Bay, because it's been out a long time. It, got, it, it won a bunch of, uh, of different things. It was a finalist for the Best Book Award in seven states. It, was, it, did, it did quite well. I'm hoping this book's going to do some of the same things. Yes? Um, about all the books I've written, the, uh, two books, really. Buccaneer Spit and The Girl from Felony Bay are my two favorite books. Yes? Um. No, the girl from Felony Bay uh, went through the, <clears throat> this book's only been out a couple months and it hasn't gone through the award cycles yet. I'm hoping it gets some, but uh, the girl from Felony Bay got, got a, a bunch. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is all of your books on like nature, like how your, this book was on like, like turtles and plastic bags and how we should stop? I would say nature plays a role in all my books because part of the reason is is that they're, they're set in South Carolina, they're set down in coastal South Carolina, which is a very beautiful, very wild place where nature is really visible and, and it's, you're just so aware of it. It's almost like a character in all my books. And uh, I don't even think about, you know, I, I have thought about it, but in retrospect, I don't think about it in yeah, in, as I'm writing my books, but I, I, f I think that the place is important. And the, in South Carolina, the place, and coastal South Carolina, the place is powerful. And it's fun to write about all the different things that are there that, that are cool to be around. Yes? I am. I'm writing a book right now that's uh, kind of a science fiction story um, a, a little bit. So I'm Working on that, I'm about 150 pages into it. Pardon me? What kind of mistakes? That's a good question. What kind of mistakes do you make when you're writing a book? Um, I remember when I started writing, I thought that I had to write every single day and keep writing. The one thing that I've changed in that is that I have to keep thinking, but I don't always keep writing. And the, when, I, when I say that, it's because if you tell yourself you have to write, you have to write, you have to write, you're just going to continue to write a plot that's going this way or write a story that's going this way. And it may be that someplace back here, you really needed to take a different direction. And it's when you hit one of those inflection points when you realize that your story may be kind of going off track, it's more important now, I realize, for me to sit down and think about it. But I may think about it. Actually, my, when my wife walks in the room and I'm sitting there looking out the window, kind of like, uh, um, she thinks I'm not working, but I am working. It's just that I look kind of stupid, probably, staring out the window, but I'm actually thinking about what I got to write. It's just that I'm not writing it yet. Yes. How do you keep a story? How do you keep a story from going off track? That's such a good question. Um, and I don't know that you know that, that when you start, if if you're ever writing and you get bored with what you're writing, if you're bored writing it, think about how a reader is going to feel. Okay, so you're off track, and then you have to go back and figure out where did I lose the energy? Where did the energy that made me want to start this story? How did it dissipate to the point where I'm bored? And so you have to go back and figure out, you know, recharge your idea. Think about what you, what, what haven't I thought of yet? Do I need a new character? Do, do I have enough conflict in this book? Maybe I need a new character. Maybe I need to put my character in a different position. May, so, you know, you, <clears throat> there's a lot of backtracking and, and filling and rethinking uh, to come up with a good idea. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you travel? to research the settings of your, your books and take 
take notes and make observations? I have, yes, I have traveled and researched. I, I talked to people. Um, I, you know, when I started, when I first started this, the, the internet wasn't the powerful thing that it is now, and you had to go to the library sometimes and sit down and with to, you know many, many, many books and go through stuff. Honestly, now I can do so much research. It's almost unbelievable how much research I can do from my desk, uh, and. It's almost like I'm going places. It's, I mean, it's just amazing what a, what a resource the, the internet has become. Um, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd rather say I have to go to Paris in order to, 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 to do this, uh, but um, I can almost, I can't smell the croissants, but I can almost. Any other questions? Yes. So it sounds like you're an investment banker, is that correct? Yes. So did, have you always enjoyed writing as a So I started out, you know, I, I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, which is a, a manufacturing town, and I went to a, um, a really highly rated public school, but we never had an author come, we never had, a, we, we never had any exposure to, you know, we had art class, but we never had any exposure to arts. I went to boarding school, and my senior year in high school, my English teacher asked me if I wanted to go to a poetry reading. And uh, we went to another <clears throat> uh, school and heard James Dickey read his poetry. He's a Southern poet. And it just flipped a switch in my brain. And I went, I, I'd always thought of authors were dead. I mean, because you, you go into the library and there are all these musty smelling books, but I never had encountered someone who wrote and did it and who was a living, breathing person. And I said, I want to do that. And so I, I went to Middlebury College in Vermont we had no fiction writer, now they have Julia Alvarez, but we had no fiction writer on the, on the, sta on the uh, uh, faculty. They had a poet. If you wanted to do independent studies in writing, you had to do poetry. So I did poetry, and I was a poet for four years. Uh, I got out of college thinking that I wanted to be a poet. I realized that poets starve. I decided that I didn't want to starve. I, and I'd also, after all the money that your parents have paid to put you through college, to say, well, I'm going to be a poet. Um, I just didn't think I could do that to them. So I went to Wall Street, where I had already been offered. Somebody luckily had offered me a job. And I was going to stay for three years and then think about getting my doctorate in English, maybe teaching college. I, I, and, but it just, three went to four, went to, 20, went to 25. And then I raised my head one day, and I said, I have to be a writer. And I saved enough money to put my kids through college. And I said, I'm, I'm out of here. So then, you know, and I, I'm lucky that I did what I did first because it's really hard to make a living as a writer, but it's really fun to do it. You had a question also. I was just going to ask, um, how extensive is your research um, to make sure that the story is both realistic? I guess what I'm asking is like, how much of it is real and how much of it are you making up when it's connected to something that is real, like <clears throat> the spit? So, so I really wanted to write about the spit, but I realized that if I were your age, I wouldn't want to just read about some guy writing about nature. I mean, nature is really cool, but you know, that's more specialized interest. I mean, that's you know, something that we encounter more as adults when, when we've really decided we're committed to something, an interest. But I had said, how do I make this really fun? And so really fun is the map and where the map goes and what happens for the last third of the book, which is that's the life threatening part of it, which is really fun. Um, and the good guys win, so it's a fun book. You had, oh, yes, I'm sorry, you have a question. I can't tell you that. You have to read the book to find out where the map goes. The, the, where the map goes is, is, that's the fun of the book. Um, you had a question. Well, I, I felt like there was a nice segue to the publishing process. Would you just talk a minute about what it takes to get published? and? So when, when you decide you want to be a writer and you want to publish a book, there are two ways to publish a book. One way is they call self-publishing, where you can publish the book yourself without a publisher. It's not impossible, but only one or two people, I think, have been successful on a, on a broad base from standpoint of, of publishing them, themselves. The way that you really have to do it is the first thing you have to do is get an agent. 
Agents are the only people most publishers will talk to. They will not talk to writers. So that's a way of publishing. Publishers protect themselves from just being inundated by thousands of people who have something that they want to, they want to have published. Agents only make money if they sell your work. You don't pay them up front. They only get paid if they are able to sell your work. So they're really, really picky, and they're pretty tough. And so th they are very blunt, and they will tell you if something is good, uh, they'll tell you, but if it's, and they're more likely to tell you that something's not good enough. That's okay. I've been in my agent's office on uh, any given morning. They will have a stack like this of unsolicited manuscripts that have come in from people all over the place. And they have a young person there who's just out of college, who's paid v very poorly, and they have to, uh, all they do is spend all day reading those things. And trust me, what they're looking for, since they want to go home early, is they want to find a way to say that's a reject. And so, if, and, and when, if you ever decide you want to be a published writer, go to the library. There's a book of agents in the library. And it t each agency will tell what they do, what kind of books they publish, and how to submit to them. And they're pretty specific. Uh, if, if they want 40 pages, give them 40. Don't give them 41. Don't give them 25. And, and if they want an outline, give them an outline. If they want a synopsis, give them a synopsis. You have to give them exactly what they want, or it's that way it can go into the reject pile. So easy to put it in the reject pile. So, and you have to, a lot of writers, when they're getting started, they'll say, you know, my book, you know, the first couple pages maybe are not the, the best, but it's, it gets really good about page 30. You're dead. Because the, the, the guy reading that, he's going to read the first page, and if it's going nowhere, reject. He might have sent 40 pages. He's not going to read 40 pages. I almost guarantee it. So you have to be able, and, and there are books that don't have action on the first page, but you want to see a level of writing that says, I want to hang with this. I want to know more about what's happening here. So then if, your age, if an agent picks you up, and I was lucky enough to get an agent on my second novel, didn't sell a novel until it was my sixth novel. So my first agent went through about three or four novels with me, didn't sell any of them, kind of said, see ya. And then I had to get another agent, got another agent, and then they finally said, and, and I was trying to write literary adult work, and the, my agent finally said, will you please write something that has a sexy plot? So I wrote a book with a sexy plot, and that got published, and that did quite well. Uh, but a publisher, when they buy your book, now you've edited your book, let's say six, seven, eight times. You've made, you know, you've, you've done lots of edits on it. You've worked really hard on it. The editor at the publishing company, they assign an editor to your book. The editor will rip your book apart and send it to you and say, this has to change, this has to change, this has to change, this is too long, this is too short. You know, and so you have a total rewrite to do. And if you say no, they say, see ya. So you have, uh, an, again, a, to do a whole rewrite. And sometimes it's a big deal with an, with an editor. The editor may see the world differently than you do, and maybe you do have to say, see ya. And that's a heartbreak. I've never had that happen, uh, but I, I know people that have. But so it's a, it's, it is a, it is a, it's a tough process, but it's, it's a worthwhile process. And when you finally get a book published, it's really, really fun to see it in bookstores and, and see people reading it. It feels great, you know, so that's a lot of fun. Any other questions? Anybody else? How are we doing on? You want to say something about if, if anybody wants to buy books, I will sign them. Okay. Yeah. How many of you think you might be interested in buying a book, um, or that your parents might, or that you might be interested in reading this book, and that your parents might say it's okay for you to buy? Just a show of hands. Okay. That's sort of what I expected. All right. We have about 20 copies available, and I, um, and we have more in the car. So. Um, 
how much are they? Uh, let's say $16. I think. Okay, $16. All right. Um, okay. Okay. What I'd like to do is get uh, those of you who want to get a bit, we're going to have our chapel service here while we've got folks. And then once we dismiss, I can have those 15 of you that think you might be interested in getting a book, stay back just a minute and let me get your names and we can charge your accounts for those, I think. So that's, I'm, I'm looking at teachers nodding. Does that sound like that might work? Okay, okay. All right, um, you guys were a great audience. I know it's a long time to sit crisscross applesauce and maybe we need to um, uh, wiggle a minute before chapel, but can, before we do chapel, can you please give Mr. Thompson a really nice round of applause and thank him for his presentation. questions, guys. All right, I can't figure out how to get the microphone back in here, but do you know how to do that?